Japan loves top three lists. The three views of Japan, the three gardens, the three mountains. You get the point. But Japan is also a country with a rich history, and much of its history is closely tied to religious and spiritual beliefs. I mean, even now they have an emperor that is thought to be the descendant of the sun goddess Amaterasu. So what if we combine Japan's belief in spiritual beings with their love for top three lists? Well, today I would like to take a look at three historical figures in Japanese history. Taira no Masakado, Emperor Sutoku, and Sugawara no Michisane. Together, they are known as the Nihon Sandai Onryo, the three vengeful spirits of Japan. What makes these three guys so interesting is that all of them did actually exist, providing us with stories that are an intriguing mix of historical facts as well as legends and tales which in some cases have managed to stay relevant for several centuries. So without any further ado, let's explore not only the lives of these three important figures in Japanese history, but also what they were up to after they passed away, if the legends are to be believed. These are the three Onryo or vengeful spirits of Japan. Before we get started with today's video, I just wanted to take a minute to inform all of you that I am now officially on Patreon. By watching this or any of my other videos, you are already supporting me a lot more than I could ever ask for. But if you're interested in supporting the production of these videos even further, starting at $1 per month, then head on over to patreon.com slash history. So with that out of the way, let's get on with the video. The main character of our very first tale today might be the most famous vengeful ghost in Japanese history, one that has haunted Tokyo for more than a thousand years. This ghost belongs to none other than Taira no Masakado, member of the hugely influential Taira clan. This guy was a big deal during his time, and as you will find out, even beyond his death. It was the 10th century when Masakado, a samurai leader from the provinces in Japan's Kanto region, staged the first ever uprising against the government in Heian-kyo, now known as Kyoto. The uprising turned him into an enemy in the eyes of some and into a hero in the eyes of others, later earning him the nickname the First Samurai. As impressive as Masakado's uprising was, it ultimately led to his death in the year 940, after the government finally sent their army after him. Masakado was struck in the forehead by an arrow, his head was then severed from his body, brought to the capital in Kyoto, and publicly displayed, as a warning to all of those who dared to defy the emperor and the government. Most importantly though, and this is where the legends get some of their ideas from, Masakado was not granted a proper Buddhist-style burial. Consequently, his spirit was forced to wander the earthly realm for eternity. Almost immediately, stories about the vengeful spirit of the first samurai that now roamed the Japanese islands started to spread. Things got weird pretty quickly, with the severed head reportedly not decomposing, even months after it was cut from Masakado's body. Residents of Kyoto who went to see the severed head of Masakado also claimed that they saw his eyes move. I don't think severed heads should do that, at least not if they've been like that for several days or weeks. A poet even stated that the severed head was turning left and right, making groaning noises and desperately looking for its body. Now that is weird, even for a freshly severed head. That same poet also claimed that the head, in search of its body, suddenly took off, flying to the north. Where did the head eventually end up? I mean, it probably did decompose like any old head, and probably did actually fly off at warp speed. However, multiple places throughout the Kanto region of Japan claim to be the new home of Masakado's severed head. The most notable of these places was a small fishing village called Shibasaki, located in modern-day Tokyo's Odemachi district. In Shibasaki, according to the legend, the head of Masakado was treated a lot better than in the capital. It was cleaned and given a proper burial, including a gravestone, charms, and prayers which were supposed to calm down the angry spirit of the first samurai. However, despite the village's best efforts, inexplicable things started to occur in Shibasaki. 
regular lightning strikes, strange apparitions, you name it. And in most cases, the head of Masakado, buried beneath the soil of Shibasaki village, was blamed. Around the year 1300, Shibasaki and its surrounding areas, which would later become Edo and then Tokyo, were hit by a deadly plague. The disaster and the countless deaths that came with it were thought to have originated from Masakado's angry spirit. In order to further appease the troublesome samurai, he was officially designated as a deity and was given a much larger shrine for his spirit to reside in, the nearby Kanda Shrine. Taira no Masakado became a folk hero during a period of time in Japanese history that saw the samurai dominate the country's politics. In the Edo period especially, his story managed to inspire all kinds of artists, who turned him into the main character of kabuki plays, woodblock prints, and books. But just like the Edo period, the reign of the samurai couldn't last forever. In 1868, the head of the imperial family was once again appointed as the head of state, replacing the shogun, or military leaders, that had a firm grip on Japan for the past 700 years. A guy like Masakado still being a designated deity was now deemed to be highly inappropriate. After all, he was a symbol of opposition to the emperor himself. With that in mind, Masakado had his divine status revoked and his shrine moved away from the main building of Kanda Shrine. Eventually, the Ministry of Finance would have its offices built on top of the ground that Masakado's shrine once stood upon. What could possibly go wrong? On September 1st, 1923, the Great Kanto Earthquake devastated Tokyo and its surrounding areas. The earthquake itself, along with the countless fires and the tsunami that came with it, destroyed much of Tokyo's infrastructure and its buildings. It was one of the worst natural disasters to ever hit Japan and took the lives of around 140,000 people. Among the numerous buildings that were now reduced to rubble was the Ministry of Finance building that was built on top of Masakado's resting place. Impressively, the underground tomb of the first samurai was still completely intact. Attempts by archaeologists to preserve Masakado's grave were unsuccessful, and once again, the Ministry of Finance was about to construct a building on top of his resting place. That's when some really strange things started happening. Around 14 people involved in the construction of the new building died under mysterious circumstances, including Seiji Hayami, the Japanese Minister of Finance at the time. In response, the building on top of Masakado's resting place was torn down and Shinto priests were called in to cleanse the land. Then, in 1940, exactly 1000 years after the death of Taira no Masakado, multiple lightning strikes were reported at the Ministry of Finance and nine other locations close by. Kawada Isao, the new Minister of Finance, took the curse of the head pretty seriously and arranged for a new monument to be erected at the exact spot where Masakado's head was supposedly buried, as well as a ceremony to commemorate the 1000th anniversary of his death. The head only managed to stay calm until 1945, when the American occupation forces arrived in Tokyo following Japan's surrender during World War II. The Americans, upon seeing the area surrounding Masakado's tomb, thought that it would be absolutely perfect for a new parking lot. If records at the Kanda Shrine are to be believed, a bulldozer which was used during the construction of the lot flipped over and killed the driver. Whether this is true or not, the parking lot was never finished. The local community, which knew all too well about the curse of Taira no Masakado, successfully petitioned against its construction. They knew that the head of Masakado was not to be messed with. Finally, in 1984, Taira no Masakado had his status as a deity reinstated, mainly due to pressure from the public who feared that his vengeful spirit could once again be up to something. In addition, the nearby Mitsubishi UFJ Bank opened an actual bank account under the name Taira no Masakado. The account contains all of the donations that are presented to the first samurai's gravesite, which amount to around 800,000 yen or $7,000 per year. The money is used by a group of volunteers and local businesses who even today make sure that the monument is kept in good shape at all times in order to appease Masakado. And so far, it seems like they've been doing a pretty good job at calming down the samurai spirit that has been busy terrorizing the citizens of Japan for more than a thousand years. Our next Onryo was not a samurai like Masakado. In fact, he was exactly the type of guy that Masakado despised the most. An emperor. 
Emperor Sutoku was born in 1119, and at least officially, he was the son of the reigning emperor, Toba. It was, however, not really a secret that Sutoku's actual father was the former emperor, Shirakawa. This whole family situation would have a great impact on Sutoku's life, and even beyond his eventual death, according to many. Sutoku was constantly referred to by his quote-unquote father as a bastard, and overall just didn't have it all that easy in life. At least by noble standards. However, his biological father, the retired Emperor Shirakawa, still held immense power behind the scenes, and was actually able to force Toba into retirement at some point. With that, the stage was set for Sutoku to become the new Emperor of Japan. All well and good, and a happy ending for Sutoku, right? Well, not exactly. You see, Shirakawa, who helped Sutoku out by forcing Toba into retirement, passed away in 1129. What followed was a series of disputes between Toba and Sutoku, which ultimately resulted in the Hogen Rebellion, a short civil war that took place inside the capital. Much to his dismay, Sutoku was on the losing side of the rebellion. He was consequently exiled from Kyoto and forced to live in Sanuki province, where he became a monk who spent the rest of his life copying holy manuscripts. To add even more salt to the exiled emperor's wounds, the manuscripts that he created weren't even accepted back in the capital. They feared that the former emperor might attempt to curse them, with some even going as far as claiming that Sutoku bit off his own tongue in order to use the blood as ink for creating his manuscripts. Sutoku passed away in 1164, his mind filled with hatred towards the imperial court that humiliated and forced him into exile. Go Shirakawa, who was the emperor at the time of Sutoku's death, specifically ordered that his predecessor's passing shall not be mourned, and that no funeral would be organized by the state. Honestly, I really can't blame people for thinking that what happened next was caused by none other than the vengeful spirit of Emperor Sutoku. Similar to Masakado's head, the corpse of Sutoku was said to have looked as fresh as a daisy, even three weeks after his death. On the day that his body was supposed to be cremated, a huge storm came in, which forced the caretakers, who carried his casket, to set it aside for a while, in order to take shelter from the storm. As the storm finally disappeared, the caretakers noticed that the floor around Sutoku's casket had been completely soaked with fresh blood. When they finally managed to cremate the guy, it was said that his ashes formed a dark, ominous cloud around the city of Kyoto. Spooky. What actually made the public fear the wrath of the deceased Emperor Sutoku was what happened in Japan over the next few years. The son of Go Shirakawa, the emperor that sent Sutoku into exile, suddenly fell ill at the young age of 22, retired from his position as emperor, and passed away only a month later. At the same time, the capital became the victim of multiple plagues, fires, storms, droughts, earthquakes, and most importantly, one of the most devastating and pivotal wars in Japanese history. The Genpei War. The Genpei War lasted for five years and resulted in a massive shift of power. The existence of the imperial court in Kyoto was now mainly a symbolic one, while the real political power resided with the samurai inside the Kamakura shogunate. Certainly, all of these historic events would have pleased the humiliated Emperor Sutoku, had he been alive to witness it all. But according to countless people at the time, he didn't need to be alive in order to witness the downfall of the imperial court, as it was actually his vengeful spirit that made it all happen in the first place. Emperor Sutoku was actually enshrined in two different places. In 1868, he received deity status at the Shiramine Shrine in Kyoto. You know, just in case, maybe he's still mad at the capital over 700 years later. His second resting place is the Takaya Shrine in Kagawa, which also holds one of the stones that was allegedly covered by the blood surrounding his coffin prior to his cremation. Our third and final Onryo was neither a man of royal descent, nor was he a brave warrior who defied the imperial court. Sugawara no Michisane was a poet turned politician, and quite a significant one at that. Born into a wealthy family of scholars in 845, Michisane showcased a talent for writing from a very young age. Apparently, he was able to put together some pretty damn good poetry at the age of 11, poetry which he liked to write while sitting in front of a plum tree a habit that would follow him for the rest of his life. To no one's surprise, he was able to achieve a successful career at a very young age as well. By the age of 25, he worked for the imperial court, 
At the age of 33, he had reached the highest level of education available at the time. Eventually, Michisane became good friends with the reigning emperor Uda. The emperor was a big fan of his work and decided to choose one of the poet's daughters to be his concubine. What an honor, I guess. Eventually, friends became family when the third son of the emperor married the third daughter of Michisane. Being so close to the emperor obviously comes with more than a few benefits, as proven by Michizane's promotion to the position of Minister of the Right, the second highest rank inside the imperial court. Fair to say, Michizane was living the good life so far, but in the eyes of many, he was becoming a bit too influential, given that he was still just a commoner. A very well-educated commoner, but still a commoner. Huchiwara Tokihira, a noble who held the highest position in court at the time, teamed up with a few other jealous nobles and devised a plan to get rid of the poet who became a bit too powerful for their liking. They managed to convince the newly appointed Emperor Daigo that by marrying his daughter to Uda's son years prior, Michizane was plotting to make his son-in-law the new emperor, replacing Daigo. Afraid of losing his position, Emperor Daigo bought the whole story and had Michizane banished to Dasaithu, a government base located in modern-day Fukuoka Prefecture. Uda, the former emperor and good friend of Michizane, tried his best to convince his son to reverse this harsh decision, but to no avail. Upon his arrival in Dasaithu, Michizane was given an old, dilapidated house to live in, no salary, and was forbidden to even work, while the poetry which he loved so dearly was censored by the government. Dasaithu itself was full of crime and corruption, and occasionally people even came to gawk at the once powerful poet-turned-politician who had lost everything. For the rest of his life, he longed for a return to Kyoto, and of course, his beloved plum tree. One legend claims that Michisane's plum tree pulled itself out of the ground and made its way to Dasaithu, just to reunite with the poet. In 903, at the age of 58, Sugawara no Michisane passed away, lonely and frustrated about how he had to spend his last few years on Earth. But as we learned from the other two stories, shuffling off your mortal coil doesn't mean that you can't get your revenge on those who hurt you the most. Five years after Michizane passed away, one of his former students and a member of the group of backstabbing nobles was struck by lightning and died as a result. A year later, the leader of the backstabbers fell ill and passed away. Already, rumors of Michizane's vengeful spirit being the culprit started spreading in the capital. But there was even more trouble on the horizon. The guy who ended up replacing Michizane as Minister of the Right in the Imperial Court fell into a swamp and died. Emperor Daigo's second son soon passed away, and so did the oldest son of the main conspirator of the whole exile plot. Then, in 930, during a meeting inside the Imperial Palace, lightning struck the building, resulting in a fire that killed numerous government officials. Emperor Daigo fell ill, and three months later, he too was dead. The public was convinced that Sugawara no Michisane's vengeful spirit had turned into a thunder god, and one of Daigo's successors, Murakami, agreed. A shrine was built in Michisane's honor, his rank and office were restored, and official records about his exile were burned. Still, the disasters just kept on rolling in. Did they really expect him to forgive them by pretending that nothing ever happened? Finally, his spirit was housed inside the Kitano Shrine in Kyoto. Michizane also, you guessed it, received the status of a deity and became known under the name Tenjin. Today, Michizane or Tenjin is known as the god of scholarship, and there are around 12,000 shrines dedicated to him, which are known as Tenmangu shrines. Students all over Japan make their way to these shrines, asking Michizane for good grades or to help them pass their exams. From murdering nobles in Kyoto to giving out good grades to students, even a vengeful spirit can change its ways. Oh, and by the way, it is said that one of the trees now located at the Tenmangu Shrine in Dasaithu is the same tree that made its way from Kyoto to Dasaithu in order to reunite with Michisane. That tree is a real homie. Do you have any other Japanese legends, folk tales, or other topics that you would like to see on my channel? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and maybe even check out my Patreon page, if you're interested. Speaking of Patreon, I want to give a big shout out to the first few supporters listed here, including my first $10 tier patron, Busner. As always, to all of you, thank you so much for watching. Sayonara.